So this morning, um, uh, as you know, last week, uh, Charlie Sweet was here and ministered, and uh, it's just such a blessing to have him come, you know, and, and I know some of you here would have received a word uh, while he was here, and if you didn't receive a word, you know, don't be discouraged. I mean, I've sat in lots of meetings where I didn't get a prophetic word spoke over me, but at the same time, you know, it's a blessing to to listen as, as the Lord speaks in, you know, through somebody um, with that anointing, with that gifting, to speak into somebody else's life. And, you know, if there's something, and I just want to say that if there's something that stirs in your heart when that kind of ministry is going on, it's like you can say, God, I take hold of that for myself. Amen. You know, do that because if, if there's a stirring, if, the, if there's something is stirring in you, there's a connection there, then the Holy Spirit has that for you too. Amen. So, so just just remember that. So, I kind of wanted to just kind of take off on, on part of that, um, just speaking to that end this morning. And you know, I just want to say, are are you going to win the battle that you're facing? Are you going to win the battle that you're in? Amen. Well, somebody here is. <laughs> I'm going to win. You know, or even 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 better yet, are you going to win the battle? Because yeah, some of you, maybe you're sitting here saying, well, you know, everything's going pretty smooth for me. Everything's good, you know, and I don't have any issues. So, you know, I don't have to worry about that. But the other thing is, are you going to win the battle that's actually forming against you and you don't even know what's coming yet? Because that's what happens too, right? And uh, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, Verses 1 to 2. And I, just to give you a little background here, uh, we're looking at the life of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat has, has come into power as, as the king in Judah. And he, he's, he's gone in the land and he's encouraged them to put judges in every city. And he's put Levites and, and the priests in place to, to, to bring... Um, order in the land and to teach the people and and so there'd just be that um, that rising up if you will of righteousness in the land and so everything was good you know here here's somebody it's like everything everything was good there was no issues there was no challenges but then it says uh, in chapter 20 verse 1 it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is En Gedi. So here's a battle that's forming. Jehoshaphat at the time was not aware of it. Somebody else came to him and said, hey, um, listen up. There's something's going on here. There's a great multitude that's coming against you to fight against you. And so Jehoshaphat gathers all the people together, and they fast, and they pray, and and they seek God. And they're all standing in an assembly. And um, we come here to um, verse 14 to 22 of uh, the same chapter. And it said, so they're all gathered, they're waiting, and, and Jehoshaphat here, he's just offered a, a prayer, a supplication to God, crying out to people, crying out to the Lord, sorry, um, and just, uh, just seeking God. And, and then after he's made this supplication, the whole assembly is just standing there silent. And then it says, and then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, and the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Methaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all of you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves 
Stand and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kehothites and of the children of the Korathites, I didn't practice all these ahead of time, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with loud voices, with voices loud and high, just like we were doing this morning. Amen. That's, that's what it's all about when we come to worship and, and bless and, and, um, and honor the Lord. And Okay, a couple more verses here. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe in his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should sing praise to the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who came, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. We see here that this battle that was coming, that was it was forming and did come, um, that the Lord brought a word to the people as they sought him, as they looked to him. The Lord raised up a prophetic voice to come and speak to Jehoshaphat, to come and speak to the people of Judah. And I just want to point this out because when we have somebody like Charlie come, uh, you know, that's what it's about. It's the prophetic voice is for you to be able to fight the war that you're in. It's to be able to engage in this battle that you're facing. And we see the first thing here, uh, when we go back to verse, um, I think it was 19. Uh, no, what do we got? Uh, try the next one there. Sorry, Gabe. Yes. Uh, and Jehoshaphat, he's encouraging the people as they're going out to uh, take their position uh, for this battle that's, that's rising up. And he says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. So the first thing we have to do is we have to believe in the Lord. We have to believe in him. We have to believe in his word uh, as we're coming and as we're facing the battles that are before us. And then he says, believe in his prophets and you shall prosper. So, you know, God wants us to not only to be established, but he wants us to prosper, right? He wants you to prosper in the place that you're being established. And that comes through the prophetic voice that God brings, that prophetic word that he brings. And, you know, this, this Bible, this word of God that we hold right here and that we have the blessing, the opportunity to be able to read, this is a prophetic word. So, and I, I'm just saying that because if you didn't get a prophetic word uh, last Sunday, last weekend when, when Charlie was here, or maybe other times when Gary Hayes has been here, you know, these people that, that are blessed and who operate in this gift, um, you know, this is a prophetic word right here. And uh, we find in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 21, It says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, 
we see that this word of Scripture is a prophetic word. And in 1 Timothy 1, in verse 18, it talks about how this prophetic word is in place to help us to fight this war that we're engaged in. And Paul, writing to Timothy here, he says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So the prophetic word is that you might fight in the battle that you're in, that you might wage a good warfare. That's why the prophetic word comes forth. And that gift of prophecy and the prophet uh, is there to help you in that war. And I know we talk about, many times it's mentioned about how, you know, the fruit Right? We're, we're looking for fruit. We're looking for character in our lives. And that that's more important than just the gift. And that's true. It's very true. But I just want to bring balance to that because I know there's some, uh, there's some churches, if you will, um, that will, they just, it's all about character. And they're not open to um, encouraging people in their congregations to, to walk in the gifts of the Spirit, to seek the gifts of the Spirit. You know, I know there's some fear about, you know, speaking in tongues or the interpretation or even this gift of prophecy that we're talking about this morning or the gifts of healing, you know, all those sort of things. And, and there's an emphasis on the character. And we would emphasize that too, right? The character is more important than the gift. But I just want to say that... Um, God has given the gift to help you to produce the fruit. And I really think that's part of what people miss by overemphasizing character is, and, and trying to downplay the gift. Because God gave gifts to the church. He gave gifts to the body of Christ. He gave gifts to you and me to minister to one another so that we can help produce that fruit in one another. So when Charlie comes or when Gary comes to minister here, it's to help produce fruit in your life. And even here in our own body, you know, we, and, and I don't for a minute want to um, lead anybody by thinking that, you know, we just have special people that come in with these gifts. That, no, that's not the case at all. You know, in our midst here, I know there's some of you, you, you have that gift of prophecy. And in 1 Corinthians 14, you know, uh, chapter, yeah, chapter 14 and verse 1, do we have that? Yeah. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And later on in that chapter, it talks about how you, you know, each one may come and they may prophesy one by one that all may be encouraged. You know, it says that all may prophesy. You know, Moses, uh, we heard, I think, last Sunday even about how Moses cried out and said, oh, that all of God's people were prophets. When, when Joshua was trying to, when he was saying, you know, hey, there's other people out in the, in the assembly of Israel that are prophesying, you know, and he thought that was only a special place for, for Moses and, and certain leaders. But, you know, Moses said, no, all, that all of God's people would prophesy. And so for us, you know, here, you know, we, we bring a prophetic word. If, you, if you're hearing something from God, that you can speak into somebody else's life to encourage them, then we, we want to speak that. We want that gift to operate so that we can help people in the war that they're facing, you know, in that battle that they're engaging in uh, in their own lives. So, you know, let's just let's be encouraged that that gift, that prophetic gift, any, any gift is there to help us to produce the fruit. You know, Jesus said that, you know, interestingly, he said, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Amen. You know, so that's, that's that prospering the God. He doesn't want us to just have life. He wants to, us to have it abundantly. And, and that's part of the way that, that the Lord brings that, um, that abundance to us is through these gifts that uh, the Lord has given to the body of Christ. You know, it's, it's really important that we take these tools, we take these weapons that God's given us in order to fight this warfare. Um, and as I've said, you know, this, this, this book, you know, it, 
the word of God shows us how to war. And it's so important that, that we're in it daily, all that we can be, so that we're fighting, living and fighting this warfare according to the word of God. Because, you know, if, if you, we don't live and war as, as the word of God points out, then the devil is not your adversary. The devil is your master. The devil's only your adversary if you're walking in a place where he becomes your enemy. But if we, if we just let our lives go and don't, don't live for Christ or we don't try to war the way that the Lord wants us to war, then the, the devil becomes our master or even in areas of our life. And, and I know I don't want that, and I don't believe you do either. You know, so we, we want to take hold of all that God's giving us here uh, in his word and in the prophetic gifting in order that we might fight this good warfare um, and do it effectively. I see two main elements um, when we're looking at the prophetic gift um, of prophecy. And one is foretelling. And the other is forthtelling. So the foretelling is, you know, when, when somebody comes and says, I see this in your life, I see God um, doing this in your life down the road, you know, may not necessarily say how far, but I just see this coming forth in your life. Something that's not now, not now there, it's not present in your life. You're not doing that particular thing now. But... God is speaking through that and bringing that word saying that you're going to be doing this particular thing. You're going to be operating in this particular way. So that's foretelling. But foretelling is when you're not just declaring what the future is, but you're causing the future. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, uh, going back to where we read there in verse 15 and 17, we see these, these two elements come out. And he said, listen, all you of Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid or dismayed. This great multitude, of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. So there's a foretelling. He's saying the battle's coming, but you're, not, you're actually not going to have to fight it. You're not going to have to engage in it in this particular circumstance. Um, he said, just position yourselves and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. And then he goes on, he says, do not, be, do not fear or be dismayed. Go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So this, there's, this element to me is that of foretelling, of, you know, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. He's, he's pouring in encouragement there. He's, he's declaring to them and, and building them up. Um, we see this even more so in Judges uh, chapter 6, in verses 12 to 14, where the Lord comes to Gideon, and Gideon's hiding out. He's, he's threshing wheat in a wine press because he's afraid of the Moabites um, that have invaded the land, <clears throat> and the Lord the angel of the Lord comes and he says to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now, here's a guy, he's hiding out, threshing out his wheat in a wine press. And the Lord is saying to him, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon says to him, you know, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where's all these miracles which our fathers told us about? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Doesn't sound like a mighty man of valor, does it? <laughs> then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So this, this, is, this is the fourth telling. This is when, when you're receiving a prophetic word. Or again, you're just coming back to the word. You're reading the word at home, and, and you're letting God speak to you. And the foretelling is creating, it begins, as it stirs in you, as you receive that by faith, it begins to create that with, with, within you, which is actually changing the future, if you will. It's, it's, it's causing that future that 
we would otherwise be saying is a foretelling that's prophetic. This is going to come to pass. Well, this is how it's going to come to pass because this encouragement, this strength, and, and this word of, you know, in this circumstance, you mighty man of valor. You know, the Lord's building him up through that word, and, and it's, it, it's beginning to impact Gideon to move him to a place where he will begin to step into that destiny, step into that thing that he says is going to come to pass. So when you're sitting there and, and you're receiving a prophetic word, you're hearing maybe a prophetic word over somebody else, and you're saying, that's not right. That doesn't line up. <clears throat> and I'm not saying there's not things that are spoken that don't line up because we know that there are, and, and that's important. You know, the word exhorts us to judge a word as it comes forth. There, there, there is things that can be spoken out. But there are other things that may seem that they don't line up, but it's only because there's a forth telling that's happening in that word that's coming forth to that person to stir in them, to cause them to be something that they're not right now so that they can step into what it is that God has called them to be that will be actually result in that future being what it's being declared to be. So there's foretelling and there's foretelling in the prophetic word. Uh, again, as I've said, one of the great purposes of the, of the prophetic is to encourage. And we all need courage in, in the war. You know, it, it helps us to war. And so the prophetic word is not, it's not just a feel-good thing. You know, and we all love to feel good, right? I love to feel good. <laughs> I love it, you know, when, when God speaks something. But it's not so that our emotions are just stirred for a moment, you know, while we're sitting in the assembly hearing a word. You know, this morning, you're not listening to me, I hope, just to kind of feel good and say, oh, man, that was, you know, that was good. I liked it, you know, and then walk out and, and not change, right? That's not what it's there. It's, it's there to, to cause us to receive a courage. You know, that's what encouragement is, is to give you courage because you're in a battle, because you have to face life when you go back out there. Right? We all have to face life. We all have to go back to work. We, we all have relationships that we walk in that we need courage in. We need, we need that building up uh, in, in our spirit man in order to step into those things and see that prophetic word come to pass. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse 8. And when Asa heard these words and the prophet and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that, sorry, he restored the altar of the Lord, yeah, bef, that was before the vestibule of the Lord. So we see King Asa here. He gets a, a prophetic word. He gets a prophecy from this prophet, and, and he receives encouragement, encouragement from it. And as a result of it, it says he removed the abominable idols from the land. And that's another element, of the, another purpose for the prophetic word in our life, whether it's coming through an individual, a prophet, or whether it's coming from the word that the Lord's bringing in your life, is for you to get the idols out of your life, for me to get the idols out of my life, the things that are going to stand in the way of me fulfilling that destiny, you fulfilling that destiny that God has for your life. Um, <clears throat> I spoke of Gideon here, and, and I think maybe one of the first prophetic words that I'd received over my life was actually <laughs> almost right out of Gideon. Um, and uh, there was this lady, she's, she's since passed away, but um, we were in the service and she was speaking and then she called people to the front. And uh, the interesting thing, I was almost falling asleep in the service. <laughs> and then when she called people to the front, I thought, well, hey, yeah, I might as well go to the front. So I went to the front and uh, she ministered to a couple people and then she said, young man, take my hand. I was young at that point. And uh, so I took her hand and she... She was almost, like, legally, she was almost legally blind. 
So she really couldn't see or know a whole lot about me from even looking at me. But um, so I took her hand and she began to speak and she said, she started saying, um, oh, Lord, he feels so unworthy. He feels so unworthy. And then I, I don't remember the exact word she used, but she brought up the scripture verse in Gideon and about, you know, just calling forth that, that, that might in me, that, that strength. And so uh, <clears throat> here I was a few minutes earlier almost falling asleep, and now I'm wide awake <laughs> receiving this word. So, you know, God can move uh, at times even when you're not ready or when you're not expecting it. Maybe not so much ready, but <clears throat> that too, but especially when you're not expecting it. And, and so that word was just coming forth uh, for me to, to bring that encouragement in my own life. And <clears throat> sorry, as a result of that, you know, it, it encouraged me to help me to start dealing with things that were, in that sense, idols in my life. To start getting things out of my life because, you know, all of a sudden there's this personal connection, if you will, of the Lord bringing a specific word to me. And, and that's how the Lord wants to be in your life. You know, the prophetic word is, is, is bringing an intimacy between you and him. Because he knows you. He knows who you are. He knows the details of your life. And, and when, you, when you begin to sense that connection and that intimacy, it really makes such a huge difference in you being able to engage in, in the battle in this, in this, to fight this good fight of faith you know, that we're in and, and encourage you to remove anything from your life you know, that might be idols. You know, things that maybe you've set up in your life. Maybe there's, there's loves that you have in your life that are ahead of that love for God, ahead of the, the love of the, of the things of God, you know. And so that was just a personal experience that, that uh, I had. And in Second Chronicles um, 20 there, we found how Jehoshaphat and the people, they were called to position themselves. And I want us to look at 1 Timothy um, chapter 4 and verse 13 to 16. And I think uh, there's just a few elements here that we can look at that helps us to position ourselves when we're facing life, we're facing battles that we have to deal with in our life. <clears throat> and in 1 Timothy Sorry, verse 4 and verse 13 to 16. Again here, Paul is he's writing to Timothy. And uh, he says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Verse 13? Uh, four, sorry, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, I meant First Timothy, yeah, First Timothy, <laughs> chapter 4. I think I got another Second Timothy later on. That's probably why I said it. <clears throat> yeah, verse 13 to 16. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Amen. So, the first thing I want, <clears throat> I want to say is Paul's exhorting Timothy here, and he says, give attention to reading. It's very, it's very simple. You know, God, <laughs> God's ways, you know, are always simple. I find that. I know sometimes people look at this and they say, oh, the Bible's so complicated. I, I can't, I don't understand it. And uh, <clears throat> as an aside, actually, this is in my notes, it reminds me of somebody who once said, <clears throat> it's not the things that I don't understand that scare me, it's the things that I do understand. 
And so that's so true for all of us, right? <clears throat> There's things that we understand, but we know we're not doing them. But we're supposed to give herself to reading here. You know, we just need to come. We, we, we need to spend time in the word. And this, this word attention here, it means to devote yourself or to apply oneself to what is being read. So really simply put, I'm just going to say no read, no seed. Because it's this, this word is a seed, right? God, God wants to plant these seeds of, of life, of these words in your heart. And when you do that, when you just come, when you just take your time alone at home and read, that gives the Holy Spirit something to work with in your life. But if you don't put anything in there, if you don't put any seed in there, then when you're going on in your life and you're, you're facing things, um, it's, it's not going to be there for the Holy Spirit to take that and bring that to your remembrance. Because that was one reason Jesus said, you know, that he, the Holy Spirit, when he's come, will remind you of all things that I have said. So we need to be reading. We need to be in the word. Secondly, exhortation. It means a calling near or emphatically urging someone to do something. Um, and simply as we read earlier uh, in a couple of places there, it's encouragement. You know, exhortation brings encouragement with it. It has this sense of, of like a consolation to it is another word that is sometimes used. And so, you know, being in the word, allowing yourself just, you know, to have that seed in you, that word planted in you, and giving yourself to, to exhortation. And thirdly, uh, doctrine. You know, give yourself to the doctrine. And I just want to look at a few scripture verses here um, that I think are really eye-opening, if you will, fascinating when we look at doctrine. Because we often think of doctrine as just being, you know, um, a whole bunch of thoughts and a kind of a belief system that we, we each have. You know, but doctrine is, it, it is that, but it's so much more than that. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 27... And this is Jesus ministering here. And they, they <clears throat> said, then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. It was a result of the doctrine that Jesus believed, that he walked, that he lived, that he moved and cast out unclean spirits. So you see how important doctrine is in, in your own personal life that, you know, it moves the spirit realm. It can cast an unclean spirit out of somebody else or it can keep an unclean spirit from coming on you or impacting your life because of the doc by, by giving yourself to doctrine. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 16, 17 Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. The other thing about doctrine is that we must never forget that it didn't originate with us. I mean, when I'm speaking about the word of God. You know, it's easy for us to go along in life and start thinking that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm at where I'm at because I've done this. You know, I've, I've accomplished this. And we just need to refresh ourselves and remind ourselves that I stand where I am today because of the grace of God. I stand where I am because of what God has, has revealed to me. The doctrine that I have, God revealed it to me. God gave it to me. I didn't earn it. I didn't work for it. Yes, I may have positioned myself. You know, we're talking about positioning ourselves, right? But, but I didn't, aside from that, I didn't do anything. And, but it was just God who gave it and revealed it. The secondly, we see in verse uh, 17 here, it says, If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether or not it is from God. <clears throat> Your ability to discern true doctrine is based on the extent that your will is surrendered to his will. 
to God's will. So if you want to grow in, in doctrine, if you want to become solid in the doctrine that is, is in this word, and, and you want to stay true to the true doctrine, it's, it's all based upon the surrender of your will to his will. And, you know, we can all quickly think about, you know, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? I mean, in, in it, it, within his own flesh, he would have wanted to go another way. He said, Father, if there would be another way. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. And, and that surrender, you know, in his life enabled him to move forward in, in the Father's will for his life. It helped us, and it helps us to keep our doctrine true. Romans 6, verse 17. But God be thanked, uh, Paul writing here, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So we see here that there's, there's a form of doctrine. You know, doctrine, doctrine has a form. And if you stepped into uh, a Jehovah Witness hall, you would find a different form <laughs> of doctrine, you know. And so, so Paul is, is saying here, you know, he's saying to the Romans, you know, God be thanked because you obeyed from your heart the form of doctrine that was delivered to you. You stayed true to that. So doctrine has a form. You know, I, I like to think of it as a, a foundation. You know, when you're going to pour a foundation, you put forms all the way around, and that cement, when you pour it in, it forms to and hardens to that form that is laid out. And, and that's, that's really what this, you know, this doctrine, this word that we have is really also, it's, it's, it's like those forms around in our life. And the cement that's being poured into it, it's forming. This is what helps to form your doctrine to be what it should be. Second Timothy, um, and, and just I just want to add to that that form of doctrine too. It's it's really speaking of a pattern of behavior. So that's why I say doctrine isn't. It's not just a particular belief pattern that you have. It's not just you know these uh, these points that you have A B C and sub points and everything um, that you're all fitting in and figuring out. Um, it's it's a pattern because. Paul said there in Romans, he said, you know, um, God be thanked because you have obeyed that form of doctrine. So, and obeying is, is speaking about our, our behavior, you know, how we, how we live our life. So doctrine <clears throat> isn't just about something you're thinking or believing. It's about a life that you're living. And truly, when it comes down to it, we only really live what we believe, don't we? I mean, there's lots of people, and, and, and I'm sure with you, I know with me, there's areas in my life, I, I might say I believe something, I declare it, but when it really comes to have to step out into it and walk in it, we don't always take that step, do we? You know, maybe it's fear, whatever it is, holds back, but so that's an indication that I don't really yet believe what I say I believe, <laughs> you know, right? And, and so we need to, we need that in our life, that form of doc. We need that pattern of behavior to be there. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. You know, there's a sound doctrine. And... We find here that sound doctrine is it's something that must be endured. It says they will not endure. There are some people who will not endure sound doctrine. You and I are here this morning. I'm trusting, I believe, that it's because you have endured sound doctrine or you are in the midst of enduring sound doctrine. And that's not to say that that it's, it's something that's grueling in your life all the time, that you're, you know, you're constantly weighed down on this thing. It just means an endurance in the sense that there, there comes times and seasons in your life where, where you're at, 
you know, hits up against the doctrine of God, against the sound doctrine, and you become aware, I have to make changes in my life. I have to make adjustments in my life in order to have this doctrine, this sound doctrine to, for my life, the, my pattern of behavior, the way I live, to come in line with the will of God. And that's a part of what doctrine is. That's, that's the sound doctrine. It's something you have to endure sometimes. And so that is a mark of, of us as true believers are those who endure sound doctrine. And we see all kinds of it in the church. I mean, you know, unfortunately, I say that. Um, but there's, there's many churches that are not enduring sound doctrine. They're not, they're not holding the standard that God has set up. They're, 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 they're listening to the itching ears. They, they want to hear what they hear. They want to make adjustments. They want to make changes because the culture is pressuring them, and they would rather give in to the pressure of culture than to endure the sound doctrine. They would rather give in to the pressure of culture than you know, be willing to make that stand for God and, and to make that, um, that honor for him. And to allow themselves to be to be formed to that. The fourth thing we see uh, that um, Paul was encouraging Timothy in here was meditation. You know, so he was. They were to give themselves to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, and now he says to meditation. He says to them, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. You know, meditation, simply it, it means to mutter to yourself or to talk to yourself. So, you know, if you hear somebody else talking to themselves, it's not necessarily all bad. But you might want to ask them, what are you meditating on? But um, that's what meditation means. It means to bring it up again. You know, I'm a dairy farmer working with cows. And cows, when they eat, it goes down in their stomach, and then it comes up again. You know, that's what we call chewing the cud, bringing it up again. That's what meditation is, biblical meditation, not Eastern meditation. It's not an emptying of your mind. It's actually a filling of your mind with the things of God, with the things that you've been reading, eating, and digesting. You, you're bringing them up again and meditating them. And actually, if you stand, if you ever stand and watch a cow, it's kind of neat, um, you can see this little lump come up its neck and starts chewing again and then chews it for a while and swallows it. <clears throat> I'm just prepping you all for lunch here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we need to do that. God wants us to bring that up, to, to regurgitate that food, you know, and chew on it again. It's part of the digestion process. It's part of you breaking down that word and getting that word in your spirit, in your heart. Another part of imagine, or sorry, of meditation is to imagine. You know, as you, you meditate on things that God's speaking and declaring, and he's saying who you are in Christ, and you don't really see yourself there, but God's putting, it helps to put a picture in your mind so that you can imagine yourself being that way, you know, beginning, moving towards that, looking that way. And, and I'm not one that's, that's big on imagination. I know you know, the world gets off in a whole different aspect of it um, that is not at all helpful. But there, is, but there is an element in God where imagination is good, it's wholesome, and it comes out of this meditating on the Word of God, knowing who you are in Christ, imagining, you know, what it's like to be there and starting to move towards it, right? Because when you, when you imagine something, you know, uh, like right now, Pastor Travis and Camilla, they're down uh, in Virginia, you know, and so, you know, we, you can imagine yourself being there, or imagine yourself being in Cuba or somewhere, you know, and it, 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 it stirs in you um, the desire and what it takes for you to make the efforts to do the plans, to walk out everything it takes you to actually get there. And so that's, that's the importance of imagination in the life of a believer. And then fifth and finally here, uh, we, f we find Paul uh, exhorting Timothy <clears throat> to 
uh, to a self-examination. He says in verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. So, you know, he brings that doctrine up again. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So he says, take heed to yourself. In other words, examine yourself. Look at yourself. Judge yourself. And that's another whole topic. I would love to, to touch on that one. And maybe someday, between Pastor Travis and myself, we will. Because I think judgment is something that is so misunderstood in, in the church. And uh, anyways, I'm not going to go there this morning, except to say that we're exhorted here to examine ourselves. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 31, uh, where Paul is talking about um, taking the, the, the elements, you know, the bread and the wine in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. And he says, he says for us to judge ourselves, you know, before you partake of those things, examine yourself, judge yourself. He said for some in the church... Um, and this is even in the church because they weren't, because they were taking of those things in an unworthy manner. Some were getting sick, some were even dying. You know, so it's very important that we examine ourselves, very important that, that we judge ourselves and make sure that we're walking as God would have us walk. And I want to tie it in just simply with this last thought. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 20, Paul writing to the Thessalonians there, he said, um, do not despise prophecies. Nice short verse. Do not despise prophecies. And you know what brings a despising of prophecies is if people that are proclaiming something, that they are something that they're not, they're being hypocritical, um, it brings a despising of that. And if we have... If we have prophecies sometimes, you know, that can go forth, and if, if they're not right, and as I was saying, you know, earlier, there's times that, yeah, there are words that people are trying to give to be prophetic that are not right. You know, they're, they're out of order, um, and that's another reason why we need to judge those things, you know, as those who are hearing and, and listening, and, and Paul exhorts even in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 later on in that chapter, about those who are sitting by. Let them judge. Let them judge what's being said. Let them judge what's being declared, you know, over these things. And, and the reason Paul is, is saying that, and the reason we have this here, just not to despise prophecy, because if something's coming forth uh, that's not right, it's important that somebody speaks into it. It's important that somebody says, hey, you know, I don't think that was from the Lord. I don't, I don't think that's... Uh, in line with what God's doing here, what, what God is saying here. And if, if there isn't correction brought to it, eventually either that individual or those who, who happen to listen in on it, they're going to despise prophecies. And I believe that in, in, in some churches, uh, they don't want those things exercised because some people have experienced that. They've been in a situation where it wasn't brought forth properly. And, and so they begin to despise it. It's like, I don't want that gift happening here. I'm not going to make room for that gift to move and operate here. And that is, you know, we certainly do not want that in this house. But if something is spoken out of order, then, then we want to speak into it. And I was um, involved one time with, with uh, a ministry team. And... Um, this person brought forth a prophetic word uh, to, the, to the team. And you know what? What she said, what was said was like it was right on. But it was the way she brought it. It was, it was, it was very harsh. It was very condemning. And it, it was really strange because, as I say, like what was being said was good, but the way that the spirit in which she ministered was, was harsh. It was it was actually, um, it was actually the opposite of the words that she was speaking. The word that she was speaking was good, but the spirit in which she brought it wasn't good. And in that situation, it was so important for us to go and say to this person, "Hey, you know what? I think the word that you brought was was good. Like the word that you brought forth was good, but the way that you brought it was 
it, it, it was harsh, like it, it, and it affected, I could see it was affecting this ministry team. Um, and, and so it was important to bring correction to that, to bring, you know, just, you know, not, not to slam the person. You're, we're not there to, to criticize, you know, we're, we're judging these things. Judgment does not mean to be critical. You know, it doesn't mean to be negative. That's not the point, but it was to bring a wholesomeness to something, you know, even if it's out of line. And just to go back to this person, and, and, and so I just tried to simply, you know, I wanted to say to that person that what you said was good, but the spirit which you brought it was, was um, it was harsh. You know, like Paul says, and I think it's Galatians, he says, you know, if, if you who are mature see someone um, that's fallen, well, not necessarily fall away, but they're, they're, they're missing it. He says, then restore them in the spirit of gentleness. You know, so, and this person was, they were trying to get the ministry team to move into something, but it wasn't brought with a spirit of gentleness. And I'm not saying that there isn't times where, you know, there's a hard word that comes, and it doesn't, it's not necessarily supposed to feel nice and gentle, right? But I'm just saying in this particular case, what was being spoken was not, it, it didn't line up with the word that they spoke. So all that, just to simply say, that um, we don't want people to despise prophecy. We, we need to, we need to judge, and we need to, in the sense of you know, maybe go to to the person afterwards and share your concern about it, and, and maybe what you saw didn't didn't fit in right. Um, in those things. So again, giving ourselves to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, to meditation. And to, uh, sorry, self-examination. And I think these are things that help us to position ourselves when it comes to the prophetic word. You know, when he they, when they said to Josh, Jehoshaphat and the people there, position yourself. You know, just position yourself. You're not going to have to fight, but position yourself. And these are ways that we as, as God's people can position ourselves to, um, to receive that prophetic word from God or to receive his word here. So, you know, you can win your battle. You can, you can be helped to win your battle through the prophetic. <clears throat> and not only can you win, but you can prosper. You know, as, as the people there in, in Jehoshaphat's day uh, were encouraged. You know, believe his prophets that you may prosper. And I just want to finish off in Second Chronicles and going on later. After Jehoshaphat and them, they... They stood, they took their position in this battle, and then in verse um, 20 and 25 to 26 there, we see that, you know, that what happened in the end was these, these, their enemy ended up rising up against each other and killing each other off, and not, it says not even one escaped, and then when the Israelites came, and it said they were so much spoil that it took them three days to haul that back home. You know, that was a prosperity that resulted from their believing in the prophetic word, from going out. You know, if they hadn't, hadn't even gone out, then God wouldn't even have set up the ambush. You know, there's, there's, always, a, um, there's always a mixing of our faith with the prophetic word that's being given in order to see it come to pass. And it says here they, that um, the place where all these spoils came, it said it was in the Valley of Bererica, which means the Valley of Blessing. And God wants to turn your valley into a Valley of Blessing. Amen? Whatever you're facing, whatever the battle is, whatever the hardship, you know, the prophetic word is there. The word of God is there. The prophetic word that somebody else gives or speaks over your eyes. Or the prophetic word that you are blessed to have the opportunity to speak over somebody and into their life that God's giving you is to turn their valley into a valley of blessing. Amen. 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 So, yeah, well, we just close in prayer this morning. And um, the altar is, is always open. Um, Marilyn and some others, if you want to come up, Sharon, if, um, as you see need anyways, if you, you know, if there's something you, you feel you want prayer for, um, just something you're facing, whatever it is, and, and you're looking for some uh, 
encouragement. You know, we're just, we're here to breathe into that. We're here to pray into that and, uh, and help you in your battle. You know, when you go, we all go to battle. It, we're never called to battle that alone. You know, God, God calls us to share in that with, uh, with each other. So, Father, we just bless you this morning. We just thank you, God, for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the prophetic word that you've given. God, we just thank you for the gift of prophecy. We thank you for the gift of your prophetic word that we find in the scripture. Lord, we thank you for how it brings that encouragement in our life, brings that uh, power and that anointing in our life to be able to walk in something that we couldn't walk in before. And so, Lord, we just want to say thank you this morning. I pray your blessing, Lord, just on each one that's here this morning that, Father God, that you would bless them, that you would cause them to know that their valley can be a valley of blessing. And, Lord, that you would just come and just just meet each one, Father God, where they are, God, in their walk today. Lord, just bless them. God, we just uh, desire that each one of us here, that we would just be a blessing to one another in this house, that as we go out, Lord God, into our community, to our families, Lord, that we will just step out into these things, God, that you exhort us to to step out into and walk in. So, Lord, we just give you thanks. We give you all the glory and the honor. We say, God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth in our lives, even as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. amen.